Welcome to Hacking PowerPoint for Developers. Effective presentations are hard. When presenting, many developers show a few traditional bullet point slides and discount the usage of PowerPoint or Keynote, and then resort to unpredictable live demos. From a developer's perspective, I will highlight the simple but usually overlooked features within PowerPoint and some conventions that you can apply to your next presentation. I will also demonstrate how PowerPoint can be used for storyboards and as an alternative to Camtasia for recorded demos, as well as a replacement for a live demo. It is time for you to revisit the powerful and easy to use capabilities of PowerPoint. The first part, hacking PowerPoint, I will reduce the noise of this content producing tool and highlight the things that you should really understand. I will uncover some of the practical and usually hidden features. I will also identify some features to avoid and share some conventions to apply to your next presentation. In the second part, PowerPoint for developers, I will not only share some programming aspects that you probably have not seen before, more importantly I'll show you how you can use this tool with certain conventions and other tools in order to effectively communicate to an audience, your team, or one-on-one. -on -one. Once you apply this workflow, you will discover the speed and how fast you can produce effective content. There are so many different ways that you can share the content produced in this tool. In the last part, publishing presentations, I will reveal how PowerPoint is more approachable than Camtasia, a video recording and editing tool. We will have a brief look inside the PPTX format. From there, you will discover PowerPoint is a nice in-between content producing tool. Before we begin, I really feel like I should clarify a few other things. So why this presentation? Well, while Prepping for a different presentation called OpenSource.net eCommerce Solutions Compared, it felt like I was producing a lot of content that felt, well, very PowerPointy. I wanted to produce more comparison-themed presentations, but I wanted to discover some better patterns before continuing. I first watched the Portsight course, simply called Using Office PowerPoint 2016. I discovered certain things that helped me formulate this presentation. I also listened to some other PowerPoint experts on the presentation podcast. As a result, I knew I should share what I discovered here first. So I really felt PowerPoint deserves a second look. It is too easy to find reasons not to like or maybe even hate PowerPoint. For a presenter, that is just an excuse, and you're probably not doing it right. Therefore, I wanted to identify and articulate the specific things that would help me take control of this tool. Most PowerPoint limitations are perceived. A slide is just a canvas. You should let your core content film most of it. However, it is good to have various reference indicators. Use more slides instead of bullets. The saying is one concept per slide. It is okay to begin outlining with bullets. Just try not to end up with bullets everywhere. Recorded demos or screenshots on slides can be more effective. With the right tools, creating animated GIFs for screen recordings can make things much more manageable. PowerPoint 2016 has many new nice features. It is easiest to Google PowerPoint 2016 new features in order to get to a decent list. Better transitions can be handled with Morph. The agenda was an example of Morph. It is an easy way to do a transition that looks like an animation. The new designer feature can provide some interesting ideas. Now, I have PowerPoint 2016 via the Office 365 edition. Being part of the Office 365 edition means that you get early access to some of these new features because you get updates frequently. High definition experiences 16 by nine are becoming more common. The usage of standard definition, SD, the narrow screen, which is 4x3, is becoming outdated fast. Rarely do you find users limited to 800 by 600 or 1024 by 768 computer resolutions. The 16 by 9 high definition widescreen is becoming more prominent. Most computers are using either 1366 by 768, which is 720p, or 1920 by 1080, which is your 1080p resolution. 
experiences? High definition experiences or standard definition experiences do not have to be limited to a container within a slide. This is something to consider when displaying an image or a recorded demo. However, corporate limitations are real. Where a slide is just a canvas, employees are sometimes required to use a certain template. Where one would use more slides than bullets, employees are sometimes told to limit the number of slides. Where recorded demos or screenshots on slides can be more effective, live demos are sometimes expected. Where PowerPoint 2016 has many new nice features, employees are limited to a certain version. Where high definition experiences would be nice, employees are limited to 4x3 viewing due to a template or a projection system. Now let's get into some real takeaways. Let's first start with hacking the features of PowerPoint. Like a true hack, give yourself some time to play. Let yourself get overwhelmed with the designs, uh, browse the various templates, click on a template to get a preview of the various layouts and color themes within the template. You can search for various templates and even get more overwhelmed. And eventually you just want to pick one and go with it. Once you select a template to play with, review some of the different types of slides that you can create. Just go ahead and insert a few slides. And add some sample content so you get a good sense of how the template is trying to guide you. It's also good to add some bullet points to get a sense of what that design will look like. Then play some more by selecting the design tab. Hover over random themes to get a preview of how it'll look when it's applied. Next, hover over the variants to a theme, which would be various patterns of color, fonts, and effects. PowerPoint tip number one, especially if you're a developer, show the selection panel. This is not obvious. Go to Home, Arrange, Selection Pane. Now you can control the names of things. As a software developer, this simple feature gave me the sense that I will be able to get a better handle of what is going on in this tool. Master the Slide Master. The Slide Master is the base of your presentation. When you get a sense of control of the Slide Master, you will get a sense of control of your frustrations with PowerPoint. To view the Slide Master, go to View, Slide Master, and you will notice the Slide Master tab appears. The Master Slide is at the top, and the Layout Slides inherit certain attributes from the Master Slide. Most templates have many layouts to choose from. I would say too many. You can also have more than one Master Slide, but I'm not sure how that can be best utilized. So developers, compare this to your base classes. Your slide inherits a layout slide, which inherits a master slide. There are certain objects and attributes that you can override, and then there are objects that are protected or read-only. Within the slide master, creating a new layout slide is where you want to start. It'll look a lot like your master slide. From there, you can insert various types of placeholders. Content placeholders are used to contain just about anything, text, images, tables, videos. Other placeholders, like the text placeholder, narrows down the rules for what should be placed there. You also have other objects like text that cannot be edited when you use the layout. Matter of fact, all objects are read-only when you use the layout. Also note, the layout slide can be used as a great hack to reuse a common slide like a diagram. 
Placeholders can only be inserted on layout slides. You can copy paste a placeholder on your slide, which I think turns it into an object. The various objects can be inserted anywhere. However, they are read only on your slide when the objects are coming from the layout slide. Objects are also read only on the layout slide when inserted on the master slide. So what is the master slide good for? The master slide does not have a lot of options. Notice you cannot insert placeholders. You can insert various objects, text images, that will be read only, which are referred to as being turned into background graphics. And the default text placeholder styles are controlled here as well. The master layout button shows the system level placeholders such as title, text, date, slide number, and footer. You can control the usage of the system level placeholders within the layout slides and your slides as well. The show hide of background graphics on layout slides can be confusing. Note a show hide for background graphics is not enabled for the master slide because the concept of background graphics does not apply. The master slide itself has the background graphics. You can see this best when you add a new slide and toggle the hide background graphics option. However, sometimes the hide background graphics option does nothing with certain slide layouts. That's because other objects might be entirely covering the graphics created on the master slide. My advice, keep your slide master layout choices simple and reduce the noise. I have a total of five layout slides in this presentation. I primarily use the one with no content area. Beware of slide reset and apply to all. For example, you may delete or move around a content placeholder because you don't have a use for it on your slide. And then you may you know, add some more content fill in that slide with, with what you're working towards. And then once you hit reset, your slide will be set back to the default layout. Also when changing the layout slide, it may also reset all your slides that are currently using it. The safer way to handle this confusion is to change the layout of the slide that is based on to a more simple layout, like a title only layout. Taking control of slide reset will reduce a lot of frustration. Sections are very useful. Sections provide a sense of navigation whether a normal view or a slide sorter view. Sections simply keep you organized. Now it's time to take on bullet points. A list of bullet points can quickly be converted to smart art with one click. Not even just a click. For your selected list, you can hover over the various predefined choices and quickly preview what they would look like when converted to SmartArt. You can get a little crazy here. However, this feature allows you to get a jump start on communicating a typical bullet point list as a graphic. Multi-level bullet points can benefit from this as well. Again, not even with just a click. For your selected list, you can hover over the various predefined choices to quickly preview the conversion to SmartArt. You can get a little crazy here as well. However, I was rather impressed with the possible options for a multi-level list. You might find yourself needing to move past the convert bullet to list to SmartArt feature. And you may simply want to include or create a drawing. Depending on time, I would avoid embedding an image produced by other tools such as Visio and consider using the drawing tools. The drawing tools are pretty easy to use. 
you'll find that your diagrams, org charts, or process flows look better because they will fo follow the style of your presentation. You will also allow yourself to better identify the concepts being communicated. One concept per slide is a good thing to adopt when trying to explain something technical. Use a good screen grab tool. Snagit is a popular tool. I like PickPick. I most commonly use the feature of clicking on a window control, which can be the window itself or a control with inside of it. As a last resort, I use the region capture. The scrolling window is pretty nice as well. However, I've been using recorded animated GIFs when I want to demo a scrolling through a web page. While preparing this presentation, I saw Rob Conry's tweet about animated GIFs. Rob Conry is a Pluralsight author and someone I completely respect when it comes to presentation style. So it made me question the approach of using animated GIFs. Maybe I should chill out with some of the typical animated GIFs. However, I do see value in creating screen recordings as animated GIFs. They are fast to create, easy to manage, and pretty much produce the same result as a normal screen recording without the audio. Avoid the screen recording tool. In general, avoid video and audio embedded in your presentation. When recording a presentation, embedded media will interfere with your voiceover. Screen to GIF is a powerful free open source tool to record quick demos as animated GIFs. You can download the source code or the single executable to run from codeplex.com. There's no install. With screen to GIF, you can record your screen video from your webcam or even a whiteboard. There is an editor. I found this tool to be extremely easy to use for screen recordings. However, I have much more to explore in this tool. So when it comes to using animated GIFs or even PowerPoint for producing effective content in a reasonable time frame, so far I like where this is headed. I'm working to continually apply this tool and workflow to see what it leads to. In wrapping up this first part, I thought I'd share a few presentation gadgets. Logitech has a couple of wireless presenters. I purchased one a few years ago, but I have yet to use it. The gyration air mouse is also very intriguing. However, it seemed like it would take some practice to get comfortable with it. So I thought I'd try the Office Remote mobile app. So far, I really, really like this app. It connects via Bluetooth. It's intuitive on how it displays the presentation, navigation, and my notes. I also found the touch-enabled laser pointer to be very easy to use. Without any gadgets, the laser pointer feature can be used by holding down the control key, then mouse down. I find this to be more effective than just moving the standard mouse pointer around the screen. Now let's get into some valuable takeaways for developers that entail either programming to PowerPoint or just trying to use PowerPoint to communicate their code. When it comes to PowerPoint automation, the native language is still Visual Basic for applications more commonly known as VBA. You'll notice the Developer tab is not visible by default. You'll have to go to a ribbon customization to unhide it. Once the Developer tab is visible, then you can select View Code, then start coding some old school VBA. After adding VBA code, you'll be required to save the file as a PPTM file in order to save code with the presentation. I actually had to use this for this presentation. I know this is probably hard for you to read as it was for me to code. Even though I programmed a bunch of VB and VBA in the 90s and early 2000s, it was painful for me to go back to a not very helpful IDE. You'll either realize or remember very quickly that this is not a .NET based language. The code sample will rename the controls on your slides to match the names on the associated layout slide. Yes, the control names on your slide will be different than the associated layout control names. Also be aware that control names do not have to be unique. For normal users, this is probably okay. For developers, this is very frustrating. 
This code will also set the text of the text placeholder named section name text placeholder to the current section name. I like to have the section name in the lower left hand side of the slide. I'm sure this code could be written better. I was able to write this in about an hour and it runs very fast. For .NET developers, you have other options. There are many code samples available on how to program to PowerPoint via .NET. I found the PowerPoint code formatting add-in example on CodePlex.com to be interesting. When it comes to showing your code formatted on a slide, it would be nice to have an alternative to using an image. When programming to Microsoft Office, in general, there are usually other references you'll need to be aware of, and the version of Microsoft Office could be an issue. A few years ago, I discovered an open source project called NetOffice on CodePlex.com. This project is simple but extremely valuable. It handles many referencing and office versioning issues. It makes it pretty easy to write an external application to hook into an office application. If you're a .NET developer programming to Office, you should really check this out. Many of us are aware that we are headed into a JavaScript world more and more. Expect more support for writing add-ins with JavaScript. I recently discovered the fundamentals of building Office add-ins with Office JavaScript APIs course on PearlSite.com. A big discovery I found in that course was the Code Presenter Pro add-in for PowerPoint. The Code Presenter Pro add-in is available for free in the Office add-in store. From the Insert tab, select Store, find it, click Add, and then you're done. It supports many of the popular languages, C Sharp, VB, Java, JavaScript, PHP. And you can zoom in on the code, and you can collapse the code. I was very impressed with this add-in. Storyboarding within PowerPoint is pretty nice. There is an article called Storyboard Your Ideas Using PowerPoint on VisualStudio.com that is worth a scroll through. However, I am confused about the current availability and licensing. It still appears that you still need an Enterprise or Ultimate Edition of Visual Studio to have this feature. It is still worth checking out how storyboarding works in PowerPoint. Once installed, you'll notice the Storyboarding tab. Select the tab and click on the Storyboard Shapes button. You'll notice the Storyboard Shapes panel appear to the right. From there, you can explore the various predefined shapes, such as a web browser window and other common controls. You can also add an arrow animation for some added effect. There are other storyboard tools available, such as Balsamic. However, I think comparing storyboarding in PowerPoint to the other tools to see what is best for your needs. The out-of-the-box storyboard shapes will probably satisfy most of your needs. However, you can purchase some prettier, possibly more effective shapes from PowerPointStoryboard.com. There are so many awesome shapes offered in this bundle that it's worth checking out. When it comes down to it, these are just shapes. You can find or purchase shapes as well. The same vendor for PowerPointStoryboard.com sells the PowerPoint GUI bundle, which are simply just shapes. Go to GUIToolkits.com for more info. Using motion paths and animation triggers look very promising to help with storyboarding. The Using Office PowerPoint 2016 course on Pluralsight has a great example. The example demonstrates how you can create an interactive horizontal slider that you might find on a web page. The author, Heather Ekman, is an excellent presenter and it's worth checking out this course. In the last part, Publishing Presentations, you will discover why I refer to PowerPoint as a content production tool instead of just a presentation tool. When it comes to recording your presentation, Camtasia has been the go-to tool for many trainers. Camtasia is a very nice video recorder and editor. Since discovering how animated GIFs could be used for demos, I did not want to worry about editing a video. I really just wanted to do a voiceover. I'm not looking to produce videos that are perfect. 
I'm looking to produce something that is really good enough. I may reconsider this as I produce more content. So in my quest on how I can do a voiceover for my content, I discovered that adding narration to a presentation was built in. You can also record drawing on a slide and the laser pointer. However, if you have a normal screen recording demo in your slide, that will override your voiceover recording. Managing PowerPoint's built-in feature of recording a voiceover does not feel like you're editing a video. It simply feels like you're editing an object on that slide. Each slide has its own audio clip that can be managed or played while designing your slide. Within PowerPoint, the timings and narrations go hand in hand. You can clear all the timings and or narrations on all the slides or just the current slide. The slide recording options make it easy to start recording on the current slide or start from the beginning. iSpring Converter Pro from Spring Solutions is a pretty powerful add-in for producing content within PowerPoint. They also have a free product called iSpring Free if you are interested in converting your presentation to Flash or HTML5. Converting a PowerPoint presentation to HTML used to be a built-in option in older versions of PowerPoint. Nowadays, you have to use a third-party product to save your presentation as HTML. The Presentation Explorer within iSpring Converter Pro provides more intuitive ways to manage your slides, timings, branching, and playlists. What I like most is the narration editor in iSpring Converter Pro. This tool helps bridge the gap between editing objects in PowerPoint and using something that feels like a video editor. I'm expecting to graduate to something that feels more like a video editor. I like how I could still use PowerPoint as part of my primary workflow. The PPTX format is really just a zip file. When you rename it with the zip extension, you can see how it stores your content. You can easily unzip the content to a folder, in which I did this ahead of time. Through some simple exploration, you can see how it stores your images and audio narrations. The audio narrations are stored as M4A files. I also say the presentation where all the slides are converted to images. And we can explore that file as well unzipped and see that each slide is just an image. For one tool, the publishing options are pretty amazing. You can export a PPTX as images only, PDF, or a web page, whether it is HTML or SVG. Or you can export to Flash or an MP4 video, which then can be uploaded to YouTube or Office Mix. When you explore the contents of the PPTX file as a zip file, from there you find your audio narration stored as M4A files, in which those could be combined with another tool to create one MP3 file. Therefore, your content that you create in PowerPoint could be read, could be listened to, or could be watched. So far I have found PowerPoint to be a nice in-between content production tool. Microsoft's Office Mix seems interesting. It is in customer preview. It can be found at mix.office.com. It is a site for publishing interactive presentations that you produce in PowerPoint. The player on the site has many options like a table of contents, section indicators, and speed control. Microsoft's Office Mix is an add-in for PowerPoint 2013 and 2016. The add-in offers a different way to record your presentation in PowerPoint. You can add a quiz within your presentation. You can also upload to Office Mix from the toolbar. I recommend that you take a look at the gallery on mix.office.com. There are a good number of examples to review. Also, I have a theory of what this might lead to. SlideShare.net is a site that you can upload and share your presentations. SlideShare was bought by LinkedIn in 2012 for $119 million. 
Then LinkedIn also bought lynda.com, the online training site, in 2015 for $1.5 billion. That's with a B. And then in 2016, Microsoft bought LinkedIn for $26.2 billion. Now, there are some obvious reasons why Microsoft bought LinkedIn. However, one not so obvious reason would be the world of shared presentations. I'm not sure what this means for Office Mix and where it fits into all of this, but I would expect to hear more from Microsoft on how you'll have other options that would compete with sites like YouTube to share your presentations. In summary, sharing and collaboration has improved. There are file merge capabilities which should lead to better version control. There's a comments pane for collaboration and real-time edits through Office Online. Here are some ideas that I'm dogfooding, meaning here are some ideas that I've been hacking together. And if you have any interest, please contact me. The first is a PowerPoint video site generator. It would be something like you would experience on Portalsite.com, but the video would be on YouTube or Vimeo. It would be based on certain conventions in PowerPoint, like using sections and keeping the titles a certain name in order to create a title grouping of sorts. I'm also toying with the idea of a PowerPoint markdown editor. I still find myself going to a text editor first when approaching a presentation. I think that is okay, however, it would be nice to have something that could take my text and generate some slides. Which would lead to a PowerPoint static site generator or even a WordPress add-in for publishing blog posts. So your next steps are to just give PowerPoint a second chance or rethink how you have been using the tool. Currently, PowerPointFirst.com will redirect you to a copy of this presentation on YouTube. I hope to do more with this site in the future. I'd love to hear your feedback about anything PowerPoint at PowerPointFirst at Outlook.com. And of course, thank you.